we're talking about complex numbers and why we need them. And I'm going to explain this by starting with the most basic thing we could do. We're going to think about things we can do with numbers and what numbers would be required to do those things. And we'll start with the simplest, most bas basic thing that we could do with numbers, and that would probably be counting. And if you want to count, what numbers do you need? Well, you need these numbers. One, two, three, and so on. These are sometimes referred to as the natural numbers or sometimes referred to as the counting numbers because this is the way we naturally count. We start at one and we go up and if all you need to do is count those numbers are fine. Well what else can we do with those numbers? We could add, addition would be fine there. Any two counting numbers that you add would result in another counting number. A mathematician would say that the set of counting numbers is closed over addition. If you add two counting numbers, you're not going to suddenly end up with the result that's outside the set of counting numbers. So they say it's, it's mathematically closed over addition. You could also multiply with the counting numbers, so multiplication is good. Although, you know that um, when you get large numbers, which sometimes result from multiplication, you know it helps to have a zero. Like, just look at this, 25 times 19, for example. And you know the algorithm. You do 9 times 5 is 45, and you carry the 4. 9 times 2 is 18, and you add 4, and you get 22. Then the next step, you put a zero right there as a placeholder. And we could continue, but the point is that the zero is useful. And if you're going to get big numbers, it helps to have a zero as a placeholder. And if you're going to do things like multiplication, the zero becomes very useful in the algorithm. So we need to add a zero to our set of numbers here. So let's, let's think about using these numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. This is sometimes called the set of whole numbers. And the 0 makes certain things a lot easier. So we can do addition, multiplication. Well, how about subtraction? Well, certainly we can do subtraction with these numbers. You could do 8 minus 5. That would give you 3. But sometimes we get a result that isn't a whole number. What if we did 5 minus 8? That would give us negative 3. So if we're going to do subtraction, we need to add negative numbers into our little number system here. So let's think about these numbers. 0, 1, and negative 1, 2, and negative 2, and so on. So every whole number and its opposite. And this is sometimes called the set of integers. So we've expanded our numbers a lot from the original counting numbers, and this allows us to do subtraction. Now, the mathematician would say that the set of integers is mathematically closed over subtraction. If you take any two integers and subtract one from the other, the result will be another integer. You won't end up with some answer that's not an integer. So what else can we do with numbers? Well, what about division? Well, certainly we can divide numbers. We could do 12 divided by 4. That would give us 3. But what if we did 4 divided by 12? That gives us a number 1 third. Or what if we have other numbers that are fractions, like 3, uh, three fifths? Or 117 over 11? These are what we call rational numbers. And in math, when you see the term rational, don't think rational as in reasonable. Think rational as in ratio. A rational number is a number that can be, can be written as a ratio of two integers, one integer over another, or one divided by another. And clearly, if we're going to do division, rational numbers as answers is a real possibility. So we need to add the rational numbers in, or think of them as fractions. We can't just have the integers. We need all these little fractional numbers in between the integers if we're going to do division. Now what I'm doing here is I'm taking different things we can do mathematically. We can count. We can add and multiply. We can subtract and we can divide. And as we go down this list, our operations become a little bit more complicated each step of the way. And we have to expand the field of numbers that we're using in order to accommodate these more complicated operations. So let's keep going. What else can we do with numbers besides add, subtract, multiply, and divide? Well, one thing we do in math is that we solve equations. 
And that's a big part of algebra, obviously, and a big part of the usefulness of mathematics in the real world. If you're going to build an airplane or design a cell phone or something, something like that, the process involves solving a lot of equations. And when you solve equations, you end up with solutions that don't fit in any of these numbers that we've looked at so far on the screen here. I'll give you an example. What if you did this? What if you had x squared minus 5 equals 0? This looks like a simple little equation, but what happens when we try to solve it? We take the 5 over to the other side, and we have x squared equals 5, so x ends up being plus or minus the square root of 5. And the square root of 5 is not a rational number. It's what we call an irrational number. And the point here is that there's certain things we want to do, certain equations we want to solve, and irrational numbers show up in the real world. So we need to add those in to our system of numbers. And interestingly, if you take all the rational and irrational numbers together, you get all the real numbers. So at this point, we've included all the numbers on the real number line. So here's 0, and then we've got 1, 2, 3, and so on, positive and negative, and all the numbers in between, down in all these little spaces. And it turns out that if you just had the rational numbers and left out the irrational numbers, there'd be an infinite number of little tiny holes in the number line. Or if you just had the irrational numbers, and left out the rational numbers, you'd have an infinite number of little holes in the number line. But if you put all the rational numbers and irrational numbers together, then the number line is complete. It's a continuum. There's no holes and no gaps. And this is what we call the real number line. And these, all the numbers on it are the real numbers. And the fact that the real number line is complete and continuous with no holes and no gaps might make you think that you're done at that point, that those are all the numbers. But there's one more step that we have to take. Take a look at this equation. What if we had x squared plus 2 equals 0? Looks like an ordinary algebraic equation, but when we go to solve it, we subtract 2 from each side, and we get x squared equals negative 2, or x is plus or minus the square root of negative 2. And this is not a real number. It's not a rational number, and it's not an irrational number. This is a non-real number. It's not on the real number line. If you have the real number line, you can't find a point anywhere on this line that represents a number that's a solution to this equation. To solve this, we need imaginary numbers or complex numbers. This could be written as x equals plus or minus the square root of 2 times i. And the i shows up. So we need that if we're going to solve certain types of equations. So we started with basic counting, and we got more and more complicated all the way down to solving equations. And when we get to certain types of equations, we end up with numbers that are off the real number line. So we have to expand our field of numbers one more time, and we add the imaginary axis here in addition to our real axis, and we end up with a plane of numbers. And now we can solve equations such as this. And square root of 2i, that would sit right about here in the complex plane. The number isn't on the real number line, but it is a number. It's in the complex plane. It's a complex number. Now the good news is we're done at that point. Those are the numbers that do the job. We're not going to have to expand our number system again. We can stop here. Complex numbers is as complicated as it's going to get. You're never going to do an algebra problem and have an answer that's somewhere outside the set of complex numbers. You're not going to have to expand your field of numbers to any bigger set. The complex numbers do the job. In that sense, I like to think of the complex numbers as the real numbers. Unfortunately, the term real is already taken. But these are real in the sense that they are the numbers that really do the job. The mathematician would say that the set of complex numbers is is algebraically closed. Any algebra problem you're trying to solve will have a solution somewhere in the set of complex numbers.
if it has a solution at all, it will be somewhere in the set of complex numbers. It might not be a real number. You might end up with a complex number solution. But complex numbers are the ones that do the job. They're the ones adequate to the task. We say the set of complex numbers is algebraically closed. It was Carl Friedrich Gauss, considered the greatest mathematician in the entire world, who did a tremendous amount of work on this topic. In fact, spent 50 years of his life working on this topic. And I'll come back and say a little bit more about Gauss in the next video.